Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rupert Weston. Welcome to the DeBretz webinar. I'm going to give you some secrets today. Every one of you, this is a promise, every one of you will learn something new. The weird thing for me is that a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you about are in fact secrets, and they shouldn't be. Because let's be honest, all of us talk for a living, more or less, and we can all be so much better at it. So I'm going to absolutely help you with that. Uh, I'm going to say that you, of course, are the wise people because you've tuned in and you're learning. And I'm going to promise you three things. OK, I'm going to promise that you'll dramatically improve your impact. And you'll be doing it for less effort than you are already. You're going to spend more time saying things that people will listen to. That's got a good thing. And last but not least, I'm going to help you and your colleagues deal with Zoom fatigue. OK, that's what we've got going on today. Uh, I'm going to be looking for a bit of interaction with you. I'm going to ask you questions. We've got two channels in the chat up and running. And those channels are essentially we've got the, uh, the questions channel. And, and I want you to fire questions for me on that. And then we've got the, uh, the chat. And again, by all means, um, when I ask uh, questions to you, I want you to put your answers there. So bear with me two seconds. I'm just going to get all of that set up. And let's see. Great. We've got some people on the chat. Hello, one and all. Roman, Alex. Georgina, great to hear from you all. Now, I'd also love to, actually, I'd, love, I'd say I'd love to be able to see a few people. So I hope some of you got your cameras on, so I might be able to, to, to speak to some of you directly. It's always nice when we do that, but don't do it unless you're, you're comfortable with that. Right, just as we get warmed up, I'm going to fire a question out to you. What I would like to know is, when would you like to be a better speaker? That's what I would like to know. When would you like to be a better speaker? And what I'd like you to do is drop me an answer on the chat. So find the chat section, drop me some answers. When would you like to be a better speaker? And that will actually help me structure this little chat that we're going through today. <laughs> Somebody said now. Uh, Alam, I know exactly how you feel about that. Uh, OK, when engaging with senior members, <laughs> I'd like to be better by the end of the year. Thank you, Mike. Uh, a better speaker through Zoom. Absolutely. We're going to cover that later on. Uh, whenever I'm presenting to clients, Davina, thank you very much for that. Yep, we absolutely will talk to that. Uh, when pitching ideas, yes, I love I love a good pitch. Yep, we'll do that. Uh, Kieran, in meetings, definitely. When meeting a customer, meeting, presenting myself and my company. Hannah, thank you very much. Liam, best man speech. Great. Weirdly, so much of what we're going to talk about today is going to be, and I'll prove this, is going to be relevant for a business context or indeed a best man speech. Uh, interviews, great. Yep, a lot of this will be useful for that. Working in a team. Uh, better speaker in front of an orchestra. Strangely, I have had some experience of, of that. I've had a very, very diverse career. I'll talk about that. Great. Thank you all very much for those. That, that means we're all aligned. We're all on the right track. So thank you all for those, those ideas. Now, what I'm going to talk about, essentially three things. We're going to talk about delivery the mechanics of delivery, how I can be better at delivering my message. We're going to talk about content. And then in the last piece, we'll flip into a digital um, section. Now, we'll take a little break in between, and that'll be a chance for you to ask me questions, and I can deal with those as we go. For those of you who don't know me, I am a director of DeBretz. I'm, I'm really very much focused on the learning side of the business, but all of us at DeBretz are multitasking, multi-talented. I'm joined by Dan somewhere out there today. Hello, Dan. And um, I look after learning. My my career, or my second career, has been as a coach, a trainer, a learning and development specialist. Um, 
teaching of one way or another, but it's the second one. Uh, my first career was as a soldier. I was an officer in the British Army for 16 years. And what's really interesting about the British Army is right from day one, they teach you to communicate. So they teach you to communicate face to face. Uh, they get you to build up confidence speaking to groups of people. Uh, they teach you how to connect on the radio, which is kind of like speaking digitally. And they teach you how to write, be it emails or any other form. So again, actually the army is really good at teaching it. The army knows how important it is. But I don't see that that message always reads across into business, which I find fascinating. Um, in terms of my work with the Bretts, in terms of my work around communications, I mean, it's communicating such a universal skill. So within business, I help people with pitches, with sales. Uh, I help people with keynote speakers. I've helped a huge number of people, politicians, sportsmen, media influencers. Um, recently, I was even helping somebody speak in the divorce case in the High Court. Um, collectively, what De Brett's are really good at is we help businesses to be better at speaking to each other. And that's a really interesting idea. And what for me is important is that that touches on the whole etiquette piece. How does that match up with public speaking? simply through the idea that one of the most courteous things you can do is to value other people's time. And being a better speaker is a great way of doing that. And we're going to touch very much on that theme in due course. Um, also worth reflecting, I actually get to do quite a lot of public speaking for my own work. So I do TV stuff, radio, uh, webinars, strangely enough, uh, even live comedy, which was um, quite exciting. If you've ever met me, you'll know I'd be working quite hard on that one, trying to be funny. Fundamentally, for all of us, though, communication is the most important thing we do. Um, so there's one thing we should all work hard at being better at. It's communication. And that's what you're doing. Right. I'm going to fire out another question for you now because I want to look at what makes a great speaker. But what I'd like to know, first of all, from you is who do you think? is a great speaker. Chuck some names down in chat. Um, ideally people we know, but you can, if they're not, you can reference, reference them. Who do we know? Who might we all know who is a great speaker? Do fire some names down. Oprah, yay. Churchill, yeah, interesting. And he made a study of it. Stephen Fry, he made a study of speaking as well. Yeah, a lot of politicians here. Barack Obama, great shout for Barack Obama. We might uh, we might reference him later on. Uh, a few other speakers. Boris Johnson, on a good day. <laughs> Tony Blair, I once did an event where uh, Tony Blair and John Major were speaking and I was um, surprised to discover that Tony Blair was hopeless and John Major was absolutely brilliant. Quite interesting. Uh, Prince William, yeah. Yeah, he's had some coaching. He's good. Uh, Fiona Bruce. Yeah, Fiona Bruce is an interesting one. Yeah, she has a very, very appealing way of speaking. Oh, John Major gets a shout there. I can confirm. I have heard him speaking live. He was brilliant. Attenborough, of course. Oh, that's a good reference. Yeah, we can touch on, on him later on. Yep. Charles Brandreth. Yep, very articulate man. The Queen. The Queen is interesting. Yes, she is. She has a particular style, uh, and I'd encourage none of you to copy that. Um, you can get away with that style when you're the queen, that level of formality. The rest of us, not so much. <laughs> Alam, me, when I've had a few drinks. Um, oh, Henry Blofeld, yeah, great shirt. Henry Blofeld, what a great communicator. Brilliant, okay, and we can draw on some of those ideas later on. What I'm gonna focus on now, though, is what makes a great speaker. And actually, surprising thing is there are only two things. Content is the first. We all need good content. But actually, if it was just a question of content, we just email it to each other or maybe even leave a voicemail. But fundamentally, we wouldn't actually need to get people together in a room or get people together on a Zoom, con uh, Zoom conference if it was just content. We could just write it, doomf, and send it, send it away. So what else do you need? What you need is you. What do we need from you? We need character, personality, and in particular, humanity. And this is one of the things that I work on a lot. In this day and age, we have, we have taken a lot of the humanity out 
um, of how we connect with, with each other, particularly in, in business. We create barriers, and Zoom in itself creates a, a barrier for communicating. Um, but the language you use, the way we connect with each other, all of these take the humanity out of it. And a lot of what we're going to look at today is how we put that humanity back in. What do I mean by that? Um, imagine that you went to a, a big conference or a meeting or an event and your hero was speaking and they gave a wonderful, uplifting, interesting speech. That would be fabulous. But imagine how you'd feel if you went backstage and had a conversation with them for five minutes. The conversation would achieve so much more than listening to somebody speaking for 45 minutes. Why is that? They would show direct interest in you. You would both speak as much as you would listen. You would say things and look for reactions. You'd make space for each other to express ideas. You'd probably be a bit more relaxed, smiles probably. And the language itself would be more relaxed and less rehearsed. Now, my point of telling you that story is that our best speaking style is something that's akin to conversational. And that's one of the big secrets about this. A lot of people, when they have a formal speech to do, dust down their most formal language and their most formal style. And it fails to connect as well as it could have done if things were a little bit more conversational. Now, if you have a room of a dozen people, you can't talk to them individually. If you have a conference of a thousand people, you can't talk to them individually. Absolutely not. But here's the secret. The best speakers in the world will make you feel like you're part of a conversation, even when you're not actually talking to them yourself. So what we're going to have a think about is conversational language. We're thinking about relaxed gestures, not, not putting on a massive show. We're thinking about the way we speak to people by, by posing questions to them. Even if they can't give you the answer, you're giving them something to think about. That's what we all do in, in conversations. I might say to you now, you'll never guess what happened to me last week. Now, not only could you not guess what happened to me last week, but I couldn't hear you anyway, albeit you could chat back and answer. But that's not the point. When I pose that question, you could never guess what happened last week, I'm getting your grey matter whizzing around, the brain cells buzzing, and you feel more engaged, and it feels much more like a conversation. And that's, that's what we're, we're about. And, and more business talk, particularly, politics especially, should be much more like a conversation. If you can make it feel like a conversation, people will be more involved with it. Now, some people say, who's good at this? What I'm going to attempt to do is do a quick screen share, and I'll show you somebody who is this. This is fairly predictable. You can probably guess who I'm going to show you. But um, if all the gods are aligned, we're going to go into oop, a little bit of a screen share. Oh, and I don't know whether that's going to work. Okay, that has technology failed. Okay. Um, Never work with never work with children and technology. I've always said that, and I'm going to come on to that later on. That makes a powerful point. Okay, uh, I was going to show you a clip of Barack Obama because he's very good at that, and he can speak to ten thousand people with TV cameras. And actually, what he does is he makes the style conversational, and we can we can look at what that involves. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you lots of advice today. I'm going to give you the most important piece of advice today. Pause more, say less. If you take nothing else away from today, take that bit of advice away. Pause more, say less. We need to pause more in our interactions. Why? There's a million reasons for it. When I pause, it gives you a chance to think about what I've said. When I pause, it gives me a chance to think about what I'm going to say next. It gives me a chance to think about the impact that I've said might be having on you. There are so many good reasons. It takes the heat out of things, particularly, particularly if you're having a difficult discussion. And again, it just makes it feel 
for the listener like they're part of the conversation. Now, I could do a whole day on pausing. What I would like you to do as part of your, uh, your self-improvement process is start to watch great speakers. And guess what? You'll, all, you'll see them all doing that. You'll see them pausing, giving the chance for the audience to think. Because the audience aren't thinking about what the speaker's saying, then actually there's almost no point in, in saying the words in the first place. What great speakers do is they get people thinking. And pausing is the thing that will get you doing that. OK, I'm going to take a very, very quick break there. Um, I'll tackle a couple of quick questions if you have them. So do fire in some quick questions if you've got them. Put those into the questions box and tap in a few questions there uh, the idea is keeping the chat and the questions separate is that it just make, makes it easy for me to find things and, and read through so if you've got any questions just drop them in there and if you haven't that's fine too and we can motor on okay here we go Yeah, Alex has asked an interesting question. How might we engage these methods when talking to someone who doesn't listen, just wants to jump in with their knowledge? Okay. What I find here is you have to let them talk. But if you don't react to what they say and then just carry on talking about what you were saying, or that works quite well, that's one of my favorites, or you can say something along the lines of, Great, I would love to come back to that point later on. Again, that helps deal with it. But what you'll find is you'll set up a pattern and people will um, will get used to the idea that, that you would like to have your piece. And a lot of what I like to do in companies when I'm doing communication work is creating a culture of listening. So at one level, um, I've given you some very tactical stuff, but actually if you can tackle it at a more strategic level with groups of people who get to the point where they agree to listen to each other then that's much more powerful um, talk to us about pre prepared speech from auto cue or more relaxed off the cuff style some people are just great and natural relaxed off the cuff style that's good but i think there are there are a few occasions when when that's the right thing to do I talk a lot about valuing people's time when speaking to them. Actually, preparation is the key to doing that. But the same principle in delivery applies. Pause more, say less. And it, it takes the pressure off you as well. That works really well. What do you think of TED-style talks? I love the idea of TED-style talks. All of a sudden, people have realised the value of talking to each other somebody putting on a, a semi-formal presentation, but guess what? There's no visual aids or there's rarely visual aids. And the power comes from the speaker and their ideas. And it's that combination of the personality of the speaker putting their ideas forward. Brilliant, watch TED Talks. Be critical of them as well as enjoying them and you'll learn a great deal. Uh, let's just dive into a couple of other quick questions. Um, Yeah, somebody said the power of silence and holding attention to the audience. I found it powerful. It creates expectation and interest. Absolutely. Some of the great speakers in the world will walk out onto a, a platform and they won't speak for 10 seconds. And what does that do? That just draws people in. Absolutely. The other thing about pausing is it looks like you're thinking. Now, as a speaker, it's great to look like you're thinking. It's even better to actually be thinking too. So yeah, absolutely, power of silence. I could, I could talk for a whole day about pausing and, and silence. It is, it's one of your most powerful weapons. Um, are there any best moments in a speech to pause? No, you can pause absolutely anywhere you want. Mid-sentence, uh, at the end of sentence. What's really good, if you want to indicate that you're moving on to a different section, a longer pause will allow you to do that. So again, pausing is, is, is almost as important as the content. 
any more. Okay. Um, I knew this would come up. How do you rate Trump's handling conversations pauses? What's interesting is he consciously has changed his style. He's had that knockabout style. But when he went into the debate the other day, he had transformed it. And it's almost to say, look, my default style is the knockabout style. But I can do the um, the more diplomatic, the uh, the sort of senior statesman look as well. And and it 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 worked well. It worked well for him. Conscious we've got a lot of content today. I'm going to jump out, but there will be, and we're back into the session, but there will be a chance for more questions later on. Okay. What's the best way of getting better? Get some coaching. Um, I would say that anyway, because that's absolutely what we offer, uh, whether we're working with teams of corporates, individuals. Just getting a brush up, understanding the principles makes a massive difference. And again, if you can do it as an organization, teams of people who work together, what you can then do is, is coach each other and just provide a little bit of feedback. Okay, the next section, having talked about delivery and just, I appreciate we're having to gallop through a few things. The next piece is content and structure. Imagine you have to give a speech and some of you have given me the sort of context in which you speak. In terms of content and structure, what do you need? There's some, some very tired old myths about, well, you just need a beginning, a middle and an end, which, which isn't particularly helpful. Or the famous one is, is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and tell them what you told them, which again isn't very helpful either. I'll tell you what you need. You need a strong start, you need a point and you need a plan. That's it. OK, why the strong start? Um, simply because that's when people are listening the most. That's when you've got the greatest opportunity to capture people's imagination and to convince them very early on that you are going to deliver something that is of value to them. And that will keep them listening more intently for longer. What makes a strong start? Something interesting. You can have a fact, a story, a question, a problem that you're going to answer in your presentation or a problem that you want the audience's help to answer you, that's even better. Um, if you're going down the route of anecdotes and stories, make it make it related to the topic. Again, jokes. People often like to tell jokes at the beginning of presentations. Jokes are great, but they're better when they're related to the topic. And of course, if you've set the tone with a joke and then want to move on to a serious topic, you might have undermined your serious topic. Um, and there aren't many people who are good at telling jokes. So those things are high risk. So think about what's going to grab the attention of the audience right at the beginning. A strong start is great. <laughs> Interesting enough, um, there is one word that most people start a presentation with. Do you know what that is? Chuck that in the chat. Let's have a few guesses. What one word do people use to start a presentation? Um, um, absolutely. Yep. Well done, Felicity. Well done, Liam. I talk about the power of pauses. One of the things that pauses do is they help get rid of all of those little things that we say that don't actually mean anything, all of those fillers. When you start a speech, you want to have maximum impact at the beginning. And if you start it with, um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Rupert West. It's now sounding like I don't even know what my name is or, or what I'm doing there. Pausing will allow you to kill off most of these little fillers and disfluences. If you have a particular challenge of when you're speaking, you use these like fillers and you're um, like so putting fillers in and like really actually putting fillers in when you're not actually like really saying anything of actual real importance pausing absolutely kills the the disfluences takes a bit of practice and i can i can absolutely help with that but it really works so the point about the strong start is that it's your chance to capture the audience now 
really planning is the key things. A lot of people start with their presentation as an introduction, a roadmap, an apology, a ramble. You saw at the beginning, I told you why you should listen to this talk. I was going to promise you three things that are really important and I will deliver on those. And that, I hope, are the things that have got you wrapped up in this and got you interested. The other thing you need for a good presentation is a point. Because if you don't know what the point of you speaking is, then the audience will question what the point of you speaking is and it will all fall apart after there. Where do you start? When most people start a presentation, they start with a laptop. And I can tell you inspiration does not come from a laptop. Inspiration comes from your brain. So think about it. And here's a top tip. Ask yourself a load of questions. The sort of questions are, uh, and in no particular order, what am I here to do? Am I here to inform? Am I here to entertain? Am I here to persuade? Some or all of the above. You need to know that. And that will then help shape your presentation. Another good question is, is what would be a good result from my presentation? How will I know? Um, think about who the audience are and think about what their expectations are and plan on meeting those. Um, think about what the audience needs to know about the subject. Think about what they know already. And think about how am I going to persuade them? Because generally speaking, in a presentation, just informing people, it's a bit of a waste of time. Because if you're informing people, you can just send an email, a PDF, or whatever, and people can read it. If you want to persuade someone, that's, that's where we need people. And there are three things you need to persuade. I should tell you there's nothing new since the Greeks. The Greeks were very good at this. You need logos, rational arguments, pathos, a call to emotions, and, and ethos, the character in the delivery. That's, that's you, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about. Yes, generally speaking, you need logical argu arguments, but actually, behavioural scientists, time and time again, will tell you that what really persuades is emotions. So there's got to be some emotional content in there, in one form or another. So as you plan your presentation, just keep all of those ideas in mind and, and away you go. Now, I said um, I would show you the connection between business pitches and best man speeches. Actually, if you look at those, those questions will actually help you. What am I here to do in a business business speech? Well, it's, it's broadly speaking, persuade. Best man speech, well, actually often it's, it's entertain. And sometimes it's persuade, which is to initially persuade the audience that the, the bride has made a great mistake and then actually show her that she hasn't and he's a wonderful man and they'll have a happy life together. But what are the audience expectations? What do they know about the subject in a wedding speech? What do they know about the bridegroom? All of these sort of things are good questions to ask whether you're doing a business pitch or a best man speech. And yes, I often get asked by my business, business clients to help them with the, the best man's or the bridegroom's speeches. Now, a word on PowerPoint. I've already shown the, the perils of using technology. Um, PowerPoint, uh, and I've even seen PowerPoint used in best man speeches, which, which I don't think was, was a particularly great idea. Um, as I said, often when people are asked to prepare um, speeches in a business context, where do they start? Well, they get the PowerPoint slides out and they think in terms of PowerPoint slides. And they think, well, I've got to speak for 20 minutes, so that's 40 PowerPoint slides. Rubbish. Um, PowerPoint is where most people start and where they fail. And they rarely question why they're using PowerPoint at all. Is PowerPoint helping them? Often people use it as a, as a crutch. Well, I've got my notes and my PowerPoint screen behind me, and that's brilliant, and I can use that. But of course, what you're doing now is showing your notes to the audience. And guess what? The audience are now reading your notes and going, well, I don't need to listen to this person because I can just read their notes. Um, PowerPoint does often become a barrier to the way companies communicate with each other. And often when people have Zoom meetings, they get the PowerPoint slides out, all the little faces disappear into tiny boxes in the top of the screen. And, and then you lose the power of, of, of that face-to-face -face connection. And we'll talk about that in the final section at the end. So a lot of my work uh, working with businesses is weaning them off PowerPoint. Um, and give me a group of uh, consultants and about half an hour, and I can wean most of them off PowerPoint, or at least show them uh, why they should reduce using PowerPoint why it's a barrier and how they can do better. And a lot of what we're doing today is 
how we can do things better. We were talking about planning presentation. There are some practical considerations, such as how long. Generally speaking, don't speak for more than 20 minutes without at least putting some breaks in and letting people engage. You'll see I chopped this section up. Um, think about your style. How formal? Her Majesty the Queen at one end of formality. I would suggest, unless you are the Queen, you never need to be that formal. Uh, that formality can form a barrier to a certain extent. Um, and then think about pre-reading. You can save a lot of time, particularly in Zoom meetings, if you give people pre-reading, and then you make your presentation shorter, and then maximise the fact you've got smart people in the room to make it a discussion and move ideas forward, or get consensus behind your ideas. So pre-reading is great. Handouts for people to take away if you're speaking to them about something new. But anyway, for me, those practical considerations are secondary considerations. You'll create a great speech or presentation just by asking yourself some of those great questions that we've talked about. Um, and then finally, just a little piece on structure. Three things is usually about the right number of things to think about. So think about your point and then think about three things that will support your point. And that's kind of enough. Um, some people use the three things point to say past, present, future. They might say the problem, the impact the problem's having, and the solutions. Lots of options, but generally speaking, just typically chop it up into three bits. That generally speaking works more, works well, and it stops you trying to over-present. It helps you edit down your material, and that usually is people's problem. Remember I say pause more, say less. Editing down, thinking about three things, that's a great way to think. So on that section, my advice is simple. Plan it, write down what you're going to say, and you can script it or use notes. What surprises people is you can use a script and read every word of the script. And if you've been trained simply but properly, actually nobody will ever know you're using a script with detailed notes. I encourage you to think about that. And then last but not least, rehearse it. And that makes an absolutely massive difference uh, to your delivery. People go, I, I like to wing it, it'll, it'll feel stale if, I've, if I'm planning it, preparing it. No, you'll be valuing people's time and you'll be much more accurate and you'll end up saying what you need to say. Let's take a little break. I'm going to have some water. Do fire in a few quick questions. If you've got them, drop them into, into that questions box and anything you want to know. Uh, what visual aids do you prefer to use? Minimum would be my first answer. If I'm going to use PowerPoint, I try and restrict it to three slides for 20 minutes. And then those slides are never word slides. They're always graphs, pictures, something that I can then explain and add value to, something I can make sense of. If you just use word slides, people go, well, I've read that in five seconds. What was the point? And a question here from somebody called Catherine Lewis, not, not the Debrett's Catherine Lewis, I'm sure. Um, as a young woman in a senior role in an industry gen dominated by gentlemen, um, gentlemen of my father's age, I worry relaxing my presentation, though I can see it's effective, will lead to me be taken less seriously. Yeah, I guess it depends what we mean by relaxing the presentation. I think the basic principles are plan what you're going to say, say it clearly and succinctly, and actually that will make for a more relaxed presentation. But to a certain extent, you do have to reflect the prevailing style, but I would always try and move the, the prevailing style into one that's one that suits suits everybody and suits the audience. Yeah, you do have to target and adapt your style a little bit for the audience. That's 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 fine. Um, but as long as it's an effective style and you're valuing their time, that would be great. Oh, question from Ira here. Uh, 
true is it's just jumped up the screen. I think the question was, um, what if all of a sudden I forget my speech? No problem at all. People beat themselves up about having to be perfect. And actually, to do a brilliant speech, you just have to be quite good. You can avoid forgetting your speech by having it written down. There are great techniques uh, I certainly teach around reading. And as I said, you can read a whole script off a page and nobody will ever know that you're, you're using a script. And um, you can go back to it. There's no problem. This is one of the reasons we put pauses in. If you feel you have to keep up a constant stream of, of dialogue, of talk, the moment you forget what you're going to say, you become very conscious of the silence. Actually, if you put pauses in, you put a pause in, it looks deliberate, you can look down, grab the next bit of speech and carry on. I always have some notes somewhere. So let me show you how this works here. I let's see if I can turn the camera around. This is unplanned and ad hoc. Oop. But even doing this, a subject I know very well, guess what? I plumbed it. There we go. There's my set of notes there on the screen. So I planned it, it's a set of notes. I often script the important bits word for word because I think that's that's how to get a really important message across and it has more impact. And then there are some bits I'm just happy to ad lib. Most presentations I do tend to be a combination of all three. So don't worry about it forgetting your speech. Make sure you've got some notes and rehearsing helps. Uh, let's see if there's any questions jumping about in here. Ooh, I think that's it for the moment. Really interesting question from Bjorn here. After giving an order, uh, which you know will be difficult or dangerous to execute, how do you create excitement within the team to go ahead with it? Um, that's an interesting one because that's that sort of almost talks to a to a military context. Um, I tell you exactly what, what, let's put this into the military context. This is something the military actually teaches to do. When you go through orders, they have to be written down. They have to be clear. They have to be agreed. And, and you have to write them in advance. And often what you'll do is you'll go through this very formal orders process where you're saying, you're doing this, you're doing that. This will happen here. How do you create something? At the end of it, you close your notes. And you talk to people. And you look them in the eye. And you engage them. And you put across your belief in the importance of the operation, the likelihood of success, the challenges, don't lie about those, they're big, but make sure that the people you're giving that order to believe that they can achieve it. Yeah, a really good question. And I would encourage, it's almost the equivalent of turning off the PowerPoint in the business speech. Great, you've done the presentation, get rid of it. You're a bunch of smart people. You're giving a PowerPoint presentation. Do you know how to make the screen go blank? Does anybody know that? That's my question to you. This might be the most important thing you learn today. Does anybody know that? Drop that Drop that in the chat. Does anybody know how to make a PowerPoint screen go black? Nobody's come up. Spacebar? No. Build, build black slides into it. Good answer, Alex. Yep, I would encourage everyone to do that, but that's not it. Control B. Very close, Christopher. It is just B. It doesn't matter whether it's Mac or uh, PC. B. Boom. Guess what happens when the screen goes black? Everybody looks at you. It's like closing the folder, having given the orders. Everybody looks at you. You get that eye contact with them it becomes much more of a conversation. Um, well done, Christopher, you've come the closest to it. I've never asked that, uh, whenever I've asked that question, in any session, nobody ever knows the answer. It's one of the most important things that you can learn. B, boom, all of a sudden, everyone looks at you. That is what you want. Okay, we're running out of time here. I said I was gonna do a little bit on Zoom. Going digital. The big difference with digital is you lose um, that intimacy. You lose a lot of the micro expressions in the face. Uh, a lot of people don't turn their cameras on so you can't even see them. 
and it's draining. How can we make this better? Well, the secret, as ever, is to try and send information in advance so you don't have to spend ages boring people with things they could read. That's really important. So keep it short, keep it sweet, pause more, all of the above, and try and manage it as well, and try and be somebody who will say, right, I'm going to present for five minutes, and then I'm going to go for questions. Or um, present a piece and then say, I'd now like, Sarah, you know a lot about this, please come in and add to that so that you can control it and it doesn't descend into a into a degree of chaos. Don't forget, we also have the problem of Zoom face, where people all of a sudden, all that life that they had in their face when they talked to each other face to face just drains away. And when we talk to people in conversation, we never do it with a face like that. But ladies and gentlemen, this, this is my Zoom face. OK, try and get rid of the Zoom face. Doesn't matter if you're talking, doesn't matter if you're listening. Smile, nod, have that connection and that engagement. That, that really is powerful and it makes it more interesting and it makes it more human. It makes communication more human and that's, that's what we're all about. If you're talking, it is one of the great challenges is you don't get that feedback. So today I, I can't see any, any faces at all, but I know there are people out there. Uh, I know you're, you're listening. I'm grateful to you for that. So I think about you. And I'm making this a conversation with everyone at you. I'm, I'm smiling. See, this is the good news about Zoom, the good news, bad news. The bad news is we can't be certain uh, how people are reacting. But the good news is I'm just assuming it's going well and you're enjoying it. Uh, and I'm not worried about the fact that maybe, you know, maybe you're not getting it. If I think that, then that's likely to be what's going to happen. So I'm here and I'm assuming you're enjoying it and I'm assuming you're uh, some of you, at least, uh, are watching uh, my tired, haggard old face. So those are a few little thoughts on Zoom. There are some logistical considerations as well. So the secret is to make sure you have light. I'm sat by a window, and in fact, I have a setup here where I can even put, I don't know, even have a Zoom light for the long, long winter nights. Again, that that all helps. Camera, I make a point of having my camera up there. I've got more than enough chins that it is, and I, I don't need you looking at all of them. So by having a camera up there, I look better, but I sound better too. It's more natural. Because when we have conversations, we never have conversations in real life like that. So why do we do it on Zoom? Put the camera up. I spent 20 quid on a, not even to it, 15 pounds on a little lifter, and it puts my camera up there. Sound, sounds really important. I've made a modest investment into a little snowball microphone. That makes the sound better. Uh, and your company should be investing in these things in an ideal world. And think about the background, nothing too exciting, nothing too distracting. The same with your dress. Dress up, but don't overdo it. Don't wear a tie for a Zoom conference unless you really think it's necessary. Great. I'm going to stop there. We have just about reached 45 minutes. Let me wrap up. I promised you three things. I said I dramatically improve impact for less effort. Pause more, say less. And I said you could spend more time saying things that people will listen to. Plan by asking yourself great questions. What effect do I want to have on the audience? And that's a great place to start. And that will give you the effect you need. And then last but not least, help you and your colleagues deal with Zoom fatigue. Make the call shorter. Make an effort to be more human. Great. That's it. I've finished bang on 45 minutes as promised. I'm going to stay online for another few minutes, so do please fire in questions to me. But as I said, we're here at Debrett's here to help you as individuals or here to help the organisations you work for. Do follow us on, um, on our various channels, LinkedIn particularly, we'd love to see you on LinkedIn. Follow Debrett's on Insta, Dan does an amazing job on Instagram. I know a lot of you have joined and uh, yeah, feel free to follow follow the company or us on Insta. We'd we'd love to see it. I'm going to stay on board for questions for a few minutes. Um, we're going to send you a follow up. We'd love to hear from you what you think about this session. What else you'd like to see from us? Um, I'm going to jump over onto the questions. But thank you all for your thank yous. That's much appreciated. If you've got any questions, fire them into the questions section, and I'll spend a couple of minutes answering questions. But thank you all, one and all, for joining. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we hope to uh, to see you again coming back to the Brits. Okay.
I'm going to jump onto the questions now where there are a few questions. Uh, where do you get your camera, microphone, laptop lifter? Nowhere special. Um, I just went onto Amazon for the laptop lifter. I, I think I paid £15. Pounds. You can get really good ones for less than that now. Uh, the microphone is, is a good one. It's a USB microphone, which is really helpful. That's a good one. Um, a light again, Instagram. I, I think this is a worthwhile investment for the company because I'm speaking to important people like you, clients. So I think it's worth making that investment. Uh, Natasha, will a recording be available after? Yes, it will. I think just going onto this platform and you'll be able to get the recording of all of this. Uh, Dabroshna asks, could you kind of repeat the third point of content? Ooh, what did I say on content? You see now, the great thing is I've got a set of notes here. Um, so we're talking about, as you said, strong start, have a point, and then have a plan. And the plan is to support the point. And you can come up with three things that support your point. But if you don't know what your point is, then your audience never will. Uh, if other personal people don't have the cameras on, should you shut yours off? No. Um, I would encourage, because by, by doing that, we'll encourage you to encourage other people to turn the camera on. But also, if nothing else, you can have a conversation with yourself. And if if you um, see, there's a, there's a very complicated bit of behavioral science, but when I smile at people, they smile back. If I smile at myself on the screen, actually that reminds me, encourages me to see the power of smiling. It encourages me to do, all, do more of it. So no, I would absolutely encourage you to have your own camera on so that you can see yourself at least, but you'll also have greater impact on, on other people. Um, should you have a question slide? That's a good question. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you just press, as you've learned, B, PowerPoint goes blank. I would love to have questions from you now, please. From Heidi, how do you look at your camera on your computer to engage with the audience and check your notes? It's odd when speakers appear like they're looking off into space. Lots of tips and techniques here. So you've seen what I'm doing. I've got my, it's no great secret, I've got my notes off to the side of the screen. I always remember to come back to at least this space here. I've got my notes relatively close to the camera, as close as I can get. Um, how else? A lot of it, when you've got the really important points, just a little bit of practice, a little bit of rehearsal allows you to deliver the important lines without looking at your notes. And then you just need the confidence not to suddenly stare off at the notes again, but to look at the audience and connect with them. Great question. It's odd when speakers appear like they're looking off to sp into space. It doesn't matter too much, particularly if they're thinking. And as long as they come back and then look at the audience, you get the power there. Okay, what else have we got here? Any more for any more? Oh, Yulia. Yulia, during an interview or speech, what do you find to be the best approach to participants who may ask inaccurate questions and avoid sounding condescending if correction is needed? Okay, if it's quite sensitive and polite, th there is that great phrase of, um, I wonder if I could just take a moment to, to address the, the point in the question and then I'll answer the question. Explain what you're doing rather than just snapping straight back and, and challenging at them. If it's a hostile interview, then, then don't even put the pleasantries there. Um, if it's TV interview and that sort of stuff, don't even put the, the pleasantries there. But as you say, in an interview, then just politely say, before I answer that, could I just mention that? And often you go through there. I hope that helps, Julia. Uh, Kieran. Often interviews require a presentation stage, typically lasting around 20 minutes plus Q&A. How do you approach this given they usually expect a fair few slides? Surprise people's expectation. Only choose the slides that are important. By all to say, I've got a ton more of data here and you can give them electronically or as handouts afterwards, but just focus on what's important. 
and don't forget, hit the B button. Screen goes black. All of a sudden, they're talking to you. You look like you know what you're doing because you, you're you not relying on the, the psychological crutch of PowerPoint. Have slides buried in the back. So when you get to the Q&A and somebody says, could you talk about this? Tap, tap, tap. Boom, you can put up a slide. And then you say, this slide talks to that particular problem. Let me explain what I mean. Absolutely, yep. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Kieran. And allow a lot of time for questions. Questions are really important. And the secret is prepare for them. Prepare for the questions as much as presentation. OK, last couple. Um, when you have a multiple, multiple people in a Zoom meeting, it can be difficult to focus on the right person who's asked you the question. Is it all right, all, all right to look for the person, or should you pretend? It won't matter too much. What's, if, if you can do it without disrupting the presentation, great. But don't forget, the camera doesn't move. And as long as you're looking into the camera, at least they will get the benefit of that. Often what you can do is maybe give the answer and then say, does that answer your question? Flick across and then find them. But it's not essential. Absolutely not essential. Ladies and gentlemen, one and all, I'm going to stop there. I've talked a lot. I hope that's given you a taster of how to do presentations and pitches and speeches better. As I said, if you want any help, do get in touch. We do private coaching. We do corporate sessions. We can tackle it strategically or we can do it one on one. But thank you all very much for your time and do connect with us and do please keep in touch. Thanks very much.